All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Travis, and uh, this week's lesson is on the period that is often referred to as the high imperialism. Um, and this refers to really the era of European colonialism and empire in the 19th century. Um, so a really important time when you consider the ultimate development of wars, wars of decolonization in the 20th century, the Cold War, and actually the roots of some of the problems that we see in the world today are, are, are often laid during this period of the high imperialism. And the high imperialism, this period in the 19th century, generally is associated with the most accelerated and widespread global imperialism and globalization that the world had ever seen. And it was driven by um, new technologies of locomotion, uh, steam power, um, new forms of weaponry, the machine gun, new types of medicine like quinine, which prevented the onset of malaria. So a very significant time and one that very much shaped the landscape of, of the world. So real quick, um, definitions. It's important, you know, if we're going to talk about imperialism and colonialism, it's important that we uh, define them first. And I have a couple of long definitions here, and, and I'll read these to you, and then I'll kind of give you the short of these definitions. Um, so imperialism is frequently informal, meaning that it doesn't necessarily mean... Um, like direct control. It can be indirect. Um, and it can encompass um, control and domination of trade, um, other forms of exploitation from um, investment um, without necessarily directly controlling them. So um, imperialism really is, is a, more, is a lo more loose term, a more indirect term in which um, you can be imperial without actually colonizing. You can be imperial without actually physically taking possession of the political system of the place. By contrast, colonialism refers to political, social, economic, and cultural structures that enable imperial powers to dominate. So, so imperialism and colonialism are intertwined terms. Um, imperialism refers to effectively the ability to dominate um, a smaller people or a smaller place dominate their political system and to make some kind of advantage from it. It's a more general, it's a looser term. And colonial colonialism is the act that's used to refer to um, basically the tool what facilitates that um, imperial nature. So colonialism can be directly taking over a country and occupying it. Colonialism could also be um, occupying a country long enough to uh, create a leadership that would lead on your behalf. There are other forms of cultural colonialism. And actually, um, scholars today argue that when you look at the American West and the treatment of the, Ameri of the Native Americans in the West, that that too was an example of colonialism. And that's a more broad definition of colonialism. In the past, you know, in the past, scholars had usually associated colonialism with the direct taking of a colony, a physical colony. Um, but um, we see imperialism and colonialism in more broad ways now, and, and they're very much intertwined terms. I hope that makes sense. I think one simple way to understand it is that um, imperialism is, is, a, is a more loose term that refers to um, your ability to control and extract from another people. Um, colonialism refers effectively um, to the power structures that enable that domination to, to happen. So the motives of imperialism, the motives of empire, um, obviously at the top, economic motives, global trade, um, modern imperialism, the high imperialism, if you will, um, it really, it really marks the true beginnings of globalization as we know it today. Certainly, you could go back to the Spanish Empire and the silver trade to say that that's the beginning of globalization, and some have gone back even further than that. But in terms of the modern globalized economy, it's, it's really the, the, the high imperialism 
that kicks that you know into gear and it was motivated by largely european countries though other countries like the united states and japan get involved in the imperial process a little bit later in the game but um generally speaking it was european and the motives were primarily economic uh raw materials um rubber tin copper um these types of things um foodstuffs as well um but there was also political factors. Um, and what I mean by political factors um, are issues of national security, global security, so controlling sea lanes, competition with other European powers. Um, during the high imperialism, the age of the high imperialism, which we're talking about the 19th century really, and the early 20th century, um, during this period, um, there's a tremendous amount of competition between nations to effectively vie for power in the world and through that power at home. So uh, there's a lot of competition involved in the quest for colonies and the quest for um, empires. Um, and certainly the colonization of Africa was a great testament to that fact as the British and the French um, really scrambled to colonize Africa in the 19th century and the Germans so eager to, and the Italians, to assert their their own like power um, also colonized kind of late and took colonies that were of mm, not tremendous significance outside of their um, the kind of um, global position that they provided for Germany and Italy. So it's also about geopolitics. Um, it's about international competition amongst the imperial nations. Uh, international competition was one of the motivating factors. Um, for the establishment of an American empire um, when we took the Philippines and we annexed Hawaii and, of course, Puerto Rico and, and created an informal control over Cuba. This was very much international um, competition uh, during the Spanish-American War, 1898 to 1902, if you include the Philippine-American War. And that was very much geopolitics and international control as well as accessing resource uh, um, resource markets in Asia. There's also a cultural motive, and these are the kind of these are the three motives that when you look at imperialism, you have the economic motive, you have the national security or the political motive, and you have the um, the ideological motive, uh, which here is referred to as the cultural motive, but it's an ideological motive. It's an and this is generally the so-called civilizing mission, which was basically the idea that Europeans. Um, held that Western Christian culture and political ideas were somehow the superior ideas in the world and that this justified um, colonization and imperialism. Um, and through this, um, they suggested that they were bringing civilization to the barbaric races of the world. It was obviously completely false, but it was a justification for colonization and generally speaking just so you guys know this generally speaking the the ideological motive uh, comes as a justification after the fact um, so imperialism or, or, or empires are established for the economic and the political the geopolitical needs um, and they are justified in certain ways and the so-called civilizing mission which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute um, that was a prime justification, but it was a justification, not the primary motivation in most cases. So there was two kinds of rule in the, um, when you look at this age of imperialism in the 19th century particularly, you see two general kinds of rule. Um, in terms, when I say rule, I mean controlling your colony. Um, the British and the French uh, are the two examples that are most used here because they are the most dominant empires of this period. Um, the French tended to use direct rule, which meant that basically um, all of your leadership, major, your main high leadership in the colony is, is French personnel, European personnel. Um, and these were often used divide and conquer tactics and, uh, and generally um, were based on a, on a subjugation of the leadership. Um, in the particular place. The British often tried to use indirect rule, um, which meant using, 
tribal authorities and indi in indigenous institutions, customary laws, these types of things to kind of rule through the people. In both cases, um, imperial or colonial subjects were educated in, in France or in England and were used in administrative positions. Um, but both in, in, in France and Britain did not universally adhere to these. They made changes over time in some cases, but both methods are very flawed and, of course, subjugated the populations and um, uh, resulted in, in future resistance in wars in places like Vietnam, in places like the Sudan. Um, these are all linked. These conflicts are linked to imperialism, to this period of colonialism and imperialism in the 19th century. It's also important to note that this imperialism, this colonial era, is, um, is very brutal. And in the discussion forum, I, I asked you guys if you thought that, um, that colonialism was fundamentally genocidal, meaning is colonialism fundamentally based on um, trying to eliminate many of the cultures that you find um, and I'm going to leave that up to you guys to discuss discuss in the discussion forum. Certainly, that's a very that's a tough topic. But there are a number of cases of very direct genocide during this period. Um, the British in Australia effectively wiped out the uh, not effectively in, on the island of of Tasmania. They eliminated the Aboriginal population was completely annihilated um, in Africa. Uh, in Africa, I'm sorry, in Australia. Um, and of course, in, in the in the United States, in Canada, and uh, the United States, there were similar um, types of uh, activities against Native Americans. So it was very brutal, and there are a number of cases in this period that that are um, very clear cases of what you might call genocide. Um, certainly, North American Native Americans uh, with the United States, um, and, and and of course, uh, I would say with the Aboriginal population in. Uh, in Australia, and there are other examples as well. So the primary tools of empire, um, particularly the thing that makes um, the high imperialism, the 19th century, this period of, of accelerated, accelerated um, imperialism um, and colonialism, um, was really made possible because of certain technologies. Um, particularly the development of steam technology, steamships and railroads, um, like we talked about last week in the Industrial Revolution. Um, these allowed you to move many more people in, in much more, whether it's resources or um, goods of another kind. It lets you move things at a much, much uh, faster and unlimited amount at any time. Um, steamships also allow you to traverse rivers, up rivers, much more easily. Um, and this allowed colonial um, forces to go much deeper into the area they're trying to control. Uh, military technologies, um, increasingly powerful weapons, heavy artillery, and particularly machine guns. Um, first the rifle, but, but the machine gun really is, is the big one here, um, in addition to gunships and things like this. But the machine gun gave colonial forces a massive advantage over the people that they were trying to conquer. And it meant that, at least in the short term, they would be able to use overwhelming power to subjugate a population for a, a certain period of time. But in almost all cases, it's only a certain period of time. Um, uh, this period results in fundamental wars of resistance, uh, decolonization conflicts that occur primarily in the 20th century. Um, communications technologies, um, steamships also, but telegraphs, um, you know, transoceanic cables like the one that was um, laid from North America to uh, Europe in, uh, in the 1890s. So increased technologies, particularly the development of the telegraph, um, allow for more instantaneous communications and thus more direct control over far-flung empires. Um, <clears throat> and of course also... Um, Europeans use language and legal structures to, sh to shape colonial so societies, um, and this undermines indigenous populations. And this is something you can think about in the, you know, in the genocide question is like, you know, does trying to, you know, eliminate um, a, a culture 
by eliminating their, like, undermining their language or their legal structure, these types of things, does that also amount to some kind of, of, um, uh, of genocide? And, and you could look at just the basic definition in the dictionary to come up with the answer for that, or we can think more critically about it, too, um, I think. One thing that's not on this list, by the way, that's very significant, is the development of a medicine, too, um, of course, quinine, which uh, is in tonic water, but that's not where it's found. It's actually from a bark and uh, from a tree, I believe, in South America. And quinine, which was first discovered by the British, was used um, as it's a, it treats malaria. And so if you take quinine well, regularly, it prevents the malar- malarial symptoms from onsetting. And this really, really facilitated the colonial colonization of developing of areas in the in the developing world in the southern hemisphere, um, tropical areas uh, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. So quinine was also very, very significant here. Here's just a map looking at uh, some of the early. Um, 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 colonialism and imperialism, you see uh, you know, some of the major um, areas that were being um, um, dominated, the Americas, of course, by the Spanish and the Portuguese, <clears throat> of course, Africa and India first by the Portuguese, but the British will become very significant there. This is a map of Spanish and Portuguese colonization, but the British and the French really make the 19th century age of imperialism. They are the dominating forces in the 19th century. You look here at uh, European trading posts in Africa and Asia by the 18th century. Um, Early colonization was usually established through um, establishing trading posts from which you would um, uh, move resources and trade resources and collect duties and such. Um, These are the kind of the foundation, the, 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 the grounding for the development of 19th century imperialism the trading companies which your text talks about um, really gave the dutch and the english an advantage over both the portuguese and the spanish Um, the trading company which is a basically a private company it's a private group of investors that are interested in going to an area and profiting from the area and they were supported by the government. Uh, the East India Company, of course, the English East India Company was established in 1600. You will, if you know your American history or your U.S. history, you will know the East India Company from, of course, the Boston Tea Party, as it was, of course, the East India Company, who the British gave a monopoly to um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the beginning of the American Revolution in 1773, which led, of course, to the Boston Tea Party. It was one of the you know, catalyst to the American Revolution. There was also the Dutch United East India Company. Um, these were private organizations with privately owned ships that were given government support, and they could engage in trade, they could build posts, they could make war. They were very profitable, and this really was the basis for the early um, development of the the empires of the of the high imperialism. Um, they and, and you know the Virginia Company. It was a was a joint stock company. The Virginia Company was the company that established the Jamestown Colony in 1607, and um, the Virginia Company was a joint stock company. Joint stock companies are very much, um, very much uh, similar to these trading companies. Um, they're private um, investment companies that under that collectively undertake endeavors to profit, um, and this was a very common feature of the Dutch and the English. Um, systems. And this is a product, by the way, of the Enlightenment thinkers that we talked about um, a few weeks ago. Um, John Locke, Adam Smith, the idea that um, private investment, that um, representative governments um, was the, for them, the natural law of humanity. Um, And so uh, private investment companies were very significant in the early development of of what we call the high imperialism, which is really imperialism of the 19th century, this accelerated age of empire. And so this is a, you know, we've already mentioned a lot of this stuff, but just refers to, you see here, the high imperialism means a period, it really refers to an period of accelerated global imperialism. Um, primarily, primarily European nations, however, the United States, of course, gets into the game, 
Um, we very much started to take a role as a global imperial power. Probably, you would, could probably say in the 1850s when the United States, um, and you might go back further than that, but in the 1850s, of course, when Matthew Perry went to Japan and demanded that the Japanese open the door to trade, that was certainly a big step. Uh, but then, of course, the 1898, the Spanish-American War, was when the United States really well and truly became an empire. And, of course, also Japan. Um, Japan, around a similar time, became a, a um, uh, their own burgeoning empire. And uh, they were, were destined, or they were, they were determined to establish um, a Japanese empire in the Pacific. And, of course, it was these colliding forces, the United States... And the Japanese and their Pacific imperial aspirations that actually led to World War II. When you actually take perspective back, um, you you actually realize that Japan and the United States were fighting a war that was the result of a direct confrontation of big empires. So they got into it too. One of the most common justifications of imperialism was known as the white man's burden. And what you see here is a, a, pear, a pear soap commercial. Um, racism um, was fundamental to the age of imperialism. Uh, this is when you have the development of scientific racism, which purported that uh, somehow Western European culture was a superior culture um, to other lesser cultures. And they, they uh, like... They would, uh, or lesser races, I'm sorry, um, they would, uh, European pseudo-scientists would um, ascribe characteristics and qualities to the different races of the world, the Asian races, the African races, and they were all, you know, less than the Europeans, and the Europeans justified, uh, used this to justify their, um, quote, responsibility to bring civilization to these people. Um, it was obviously wrong and very racist, but... Uh, it was one of the ways that Europeans justified this, to bring their civilization. And this often included bringing religion to the so-called lesser peoples. And so, you know, imperialism was fundamentally, and this goes back to the discussion question, imperialism was fundamentally based on altering indigenous cultures because it was justified by the idea of civilizing them and civilizing meant, civilizing them meant importing on them impart, imparting on them European systems of governments, European philosophies, European languages, European based economic systems, uh, European notions of justice, and so on and so forth, um, and economics and 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 so it was fundamentally based. Civilizing meant to Europeanize, and so it was fundamentally based on the idea of. Uh, of undermining and transforming indigenous cultures. So I want to just briefly look at one example um, and, and kind of show the, some of the points that I've been making at work. So this is Indochina, French Indochina. The French colonized this. This is, of course, you see obviously Laos and Cambodia, Thailand, and then, of course, the three-colored one, Cochin, China, Annam, and Tonkin. That is all Vietnam. Uh, that's modern-day Vietnam which, um, of course, if you guys know a little bit about history, you'll remember maybe a little bit about the Vietnam War. Maybe you've seen a movie about it or something. Um, the Vietnam War was, of course, deeply rooted in, um, in French colonialism. So I wanted you to look at the, why is it that the French Empire, you know, why does this come about? You know, so let's look at this. It really comes about because of the three reasons we already said. So the economic reason, Right, the, the the motive for trade, for resources and such, um, the competition element, the British and the Dutch. Of course, the British were in uh, Malaya, and of course, the Dutch had 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 colonized the Indies. And, and there's a tremendous amount of competition in the region amongst European powers. So certainly, the French also do this because they. It's about it's about competition amongst your European powers and controlling trade lanes and having control or influence in international power. So it has to do with that too. Um, and it also has to do with, remember, the ideological co component, um, religion, and of course also the white man's burden or the civilizing mission, la civiltrice for the French as they called it, um, uh, 
they they justified their actions initially um, on the basis of bringing Catholicism and Western civilization to Southeast Asia. And so the competition was, of course, with the British. The resource, there were there were more. There, I mean, there were ten. There was ten. There was coal. But one of the big resources was, of course, rubber. And uh, Michelin rubber was ultimately granted a monopoly over the uh, over the rubber industry in Vietnam. Um, and of course, Jesuit missionaries who sought to bring uh, the Western ideas of religion and Christianity to Southeast Asia. This is an image of an early French steamer, early era, or early era colonialism in Southeast Asia. And this is the Mekong River Delta that you would be looking at. This is the Mekong. The Mekong is down in the blue near Cochin, China. Um, so this is the Delta region. And the steamship, this new technology, really was able to move up the Mekong River very well. It gave them, it's a very complex delta, but a lot of different areas of it. But uh, uh, the French were able to access it very easily with steam technology. So in 1862, the French took Saigon, and Vietnamese have, who have a deep, deep nationalist or a deep, a deep um, ethnic tradition, they are st strongly nationalist, and they fought the French um, quite a bit. And the French ultimately, um, the French ultimately use um, force to crush the uh, the Vietnamese resistance. They impart direct rule. Um, they also try to assimilate uh, the Vietnamese, uh, leadership Vietnamese, to French culture. They send many Vietnamese back to France to be educated. And, uh, and those who, who are resisting are crushed with, with brute force. And the image that you're seeing here, these are obviously severed heads of Vietnamese during the French imperial period. And uh, this was a postcard that would be sent back to, um, in some cases, uh, you know, maybe even like a girlfriend in France. This was all okay. This was all justified because the imperial process was fundamentally racist. It was fundamentally based on racial views. And so the individuals here were considered subhuman, effectively. The result of this reality was, one, Vietnamese nationalism. And this, of course, you see this kind of case in many other areas of, of, of the world, um, in the imperial process, and some areas you find more resistance than others. But the Vietnamese resisted the French and, um, and became staunchly nationalistic. And of course, these are the roots of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, the American Vietnam War, began first as the French Indochina War. It was a colonial war that began after World War II. Um, and the people who we fought in the Vietnam War and the French fought were nationalists who sought to kick out the French imperialists who were um, um, effectively um, at that time leading through um, uh, assimilated French educated uh, aristocrats in Vietnam. Um, so you had these two ruling classes. You have development of nationalists who were going to resist and you have the development of a French educated Catholic ruling class in Vietnam of Vietnamese individuals. So at the height of at the height of the high imperialism of Indochina, at the height of the French imperialism, um, you really see um, Vietnam becoming an example of how repressive and and awful um, this was. And you really see this during um, the the period in which uh, Governor General Paul Dume, who is pictured here, Paul Dume was in charge. Um, Vietnam was in the red, and Paul Dume was given the job of making Vietnam profitable. So what he does is, first thing he does is he just says, to heck with the civilizing mission. We're not even worried about that. We want Vietnam to be profitable. So he completely, he stops pretending that this is about civilizing, and he says this is about profit. How are you going to be profitable? Well, he's going to make the Vietnamese effectively servants more than they already are, um, Rice will be for exports, and they will export regardless of whether or not peasants are starving. Taxes will be burdened on the Vietnamese people. Monopolies will be granted to European co companies, particularly in the area of rubber and coal. And Michelin, Michelin rubber 
will get a monopoly on the rubber plantations. And the rubber plantations were absolutely nightmares. I mean, the numbers you see here are somewhat similar, not maybe as extreme, but they're pretty extreme. And they're very similar to the types of numbers you saw in those uh, Brazilian sugar plantations. Um, you had a period of really cheap and overworked labor. From 1917 to 1944, um, nearly a third of the Vietnamese workforce died on the rubber plantations. And the Vietnamese who worked on these plantations used to say, they used to say that they believed that the, that the, the people were buried under the trees and were made actually to be fertilized, fertilizer for the trees, that they were purposely being worked to death. That was the feeling. The other thing that Paul Dume did was actually to effectively um, authorize an opium trade in Vietnam, which had also been done, of course, you probably remember the opium wars. The British did this in China. And the French do this in, in Vietnam. And actually a group known as the Binh Zuan, who uh, would later be involved in the French Indochina War, uh, shortly after actually um, fighting the the leader, No Dinh Diem, who was the American ally, but that's another story. Uh, we don't have enough time for that right now. But he was one of the drug dealers. Uh, this was one of the, uh, this group, the Bin Zuan, and it wasn't a he, the he was the was Bavian. So the Bin Zuan was a drug dealing organization. It was a drug cartel basically in Saigon. They controlled a third of Indochina's income. They controlled prostitution and gambling rings, but they also controlled opium. And Paul Dume came up with a, with, a, with a method of adding a chemical to the opium so that it would burn faster and make it more addictive, similar to what tobacco companies in the United States did. And so effectively he created a, a, a portion of the... Um, Vietnamese population that was addicted to opium and, there, and therefore, of course, the French were able to control this and tax this and profit from it. Um, and so it was all designed to make a profit at an extreme exp expense for the Vietnamese. That last statement there, it, it really speaks for itself. I think the point's already made. So last slide... Um, and I use v I'm using Vietnam as an example. Um, there's many other examples you could point to, and that's another thing I'd like you to do this week is to find an example of a 20th century war that was based in colonialism during the high imperialism. Um, national resistance, Fanboy Chow, pictured here. Um, he was born in the same province of Vietnam um, as Ho Chi Minh, pictured, which is right here in the red. It's the Nang An province. Um, and it's here that you really see the origins of the American Vietnam conflict and, of course, the French Vietnam conflict um, before it. Um, Fanboy Chow believed in uh, what's called Pan Asianism. He believed in a Pan Asian movement in which Asians would unite together and create a more, uh, create a, a regional um, a kind of Asian dominion. And See, many of the Asian leaders actually read the civilizing mission rhetoric and the idea that the Europeans were saying in that rhetoric that well, you're not ready for you know civilization yet, you're not there yet, and so we're going to help you get there. But when you're there, they pledged that they would give them freedom. And um, people like Fanboy Chow read this stuff, and uh, and they 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 believed that. Um, um, that if they if they adopted Western industrial um, and imperial ways, that they could be joined in a kind of a Pan Asian Union, that would then oust the Europeans. Um, and of course, in 1905, it looked like you know they were on a way for this. Uh, the Japanese won, well effectively won in the Russo Japanese War. It's a big year for 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 Asian peoples. Fanboy Chow very much looked at this as a great moment for Asians, where it, sh it showed that Asians could beat a European power. However, Japan, who was really the rising force, and Fanboy Chow traveled to Japan, and he very much saw Japan as being the potential country that could create a pan-Asian unity. But Fanboy Chow, unfortunately, um, was, was wrong in that regard, and the Japanese actually created their own empire, and during World War II, when they expanded out through Indochina, 
the Japanese were in many respects just as brutal to um, to the Vietnamese as the French were. So, so Japan, you know, after the Meiji Restoration, which your book talks about, Japan also became an industrial power and very much sought to create its own empire. Um, Japan very much needed resources to fuel um, its economy and to create a navy um, that would be um, strong in the Pacific. In many respects, World War II represents a collision of two empires, of the United States and the Japanese. And we'll see that more as we get into the 20th century. Um, I hope this is helpful, guys. Thanks.